This session is part of Managing Diabetes, ARHP's five-part course on the reproductive health implications of diabetes. My name is Jessica, and I am the Senior Education Associate at ARHP. I will be moderating this webinar. Before we begin, I would like to clarify your continuing education credit. In order to receive continuing education credit for this webinar, you will need to take a series of pre- and post-tests. The pretest is linked above this recording, and we encourage you to take it before viewing this webinar. After the webinar, you will receive an email from GoToWebinar with a link to the post-test survey. Your continu continuing education certificate will be generated upon completion of the survey. In six weeks, you will receive a follow-up assessment to gauge how you have integrated competencies into your practice. At this time, I would like to introduce Dr. Bimla Schwartz, today's presenter. We are thrilled that she could join us today. Dr. Schwartz is a professor of medicine at the University of California, Davis. She previously served as senior medical expert in reproductive health for the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and as a member of the FDA's advisory committee on reproductive health drugs. She is currently associate editor of Journal Watch Women's Health. She is a fellow of the Society of Family Planning and is past chair of the Society of General Internal Medicine's Task Force on Women's Health. Simla, you have the floor. Thank you. As we get started, I want to recognize that this session was made possible through an educational grant from Merck and Company, but I have no direct uh, relationship with them, nor do any of the planning committee members, as you can see here in our disclosures. There were six different people who were involved in putting this slide set together, and none of us have any direct relationships with any uh, makers of any products used to treat or screen for diabetes. So our main learning objective for this time together is to recognize four reproductive health complications of diabetes mellitus. And um, we're going to start with an introduction. We're going to go through an overview of both the prevalence of diabetes, how diabetes gets classified, and what some common complications are. Then we're going to talk about general reproductive health issues, effects on fertility, and um, the relationship of diabetes to both vaginitis and urinary tract infections, and then come around to looking at how diabetes affects pregnancy and results in pregnancy complications. We're going to spend some time with a case study and then open it up for questions and answers, which you can uh, provide by using the um, keyboard on your computer. And then we're going to round things up and summarize what we've said so far and close. So as a place to start, diabetes is growing in prevalence in the United States, um, currently affects about 29 million people or just over 9% of the U.S. population. Of those, uh, about 21 million have been diagnosed with diabetes and there's another fairly large group of people, over 8 million, who have diabetes but have not been diagnosed with diabetes. So part of the reason for this um, educational effort is to try to make sure that if we are seeing a patient who has diabetes but doesn't know that, that we get that patient diagnosed so they can get properly treated and hopefully minimize the long-term health burden that diabetes can pose. So said another way, currently about a quarter of people with diabetes are undiagnosed and that's something that we as clinicians bear some responsibility for. When we look at the racial and ethnic breakdown of people affected by diabetes in this country, we see that diabetes is not an equal opportunity um, affliction and unfortunately it does predominantly affect those who are already living difficult lives and um, more often living in poverty and those would be uh, blacks and Hispanics and Native Americans in this country. There may be some genetic um, factors that underlie this but a lot of it also has to do with diet and access to food supplies. Um, currently, Native Americans have the highest prevalence of diabetes, more than twice the rate seen among non-Hispanic whites. Um, and we see that many of these groups that have high prevalences of diabetes are often the same uh, demographic groups that struggle with access to family planning services. Um, and so that in combination can be a difficult um, burden for, for these communities, as we'll talk about, because diabetes can affect um, 
reproductive health outcomes as well. So we have a quick question, which of the following types of diabetes can affect women? Um, and the answer here is that really women can be affected by all of the types of diabetes that um, women may be women or men may be exposed to. So type 1 diabetes is where um, the pancreas is not functioning well and so plasma insulin is either low or non-existent, but that the body retains normal insulin sensitivity. So if we replace the insulin, um, these people have what they need to function. And these are the people who can't take oral medications, but rather require injectable insulin to control their sugars. Type 2 diabetes is a very different disease in many ways, um, because these people have low insulin sensitivity, and so it's not so much that their body doesn't have insulin, it's that the tissues aren't responding to insulin the same way. And we can often use oral medications to control this, but with time there is um, sort of a tired pancreas that isn't able to keep up with the insulin needs of the body, and we often see these patients need to resort to insulin to control their sugars over time. The other types of diabetes listed here include gestational diabetes, which is diagnosed in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. Um, but is not a type of dysfunction in sugar control known before pregnancy. Um, this often is a harbinger of future risk of type 2 diabetes, but um, is not an absolute risk of type 2 diabetes. And we will talk a bit about the way um, lifestyle changes, and in particular breastfeeding after delivery of a baby, can reduce a woman's risk of converting from gestational diabetes to type 2 diabetes. And then the last type of uh, diabetes listed here is latent autoimmune diabetes of adults, which is basically type 1, but instead of affecting children, comes on in later life, may have a slower course. Again, these people will uh, require the use of insulin to control their sugars. There are also a number of other types of diabetes that can arise from damage to the pancreas from toxins such as alcohol or from gallstone pancreatitis or cystic fibrosis or medication use, but those are somewhat less common. So in terms of the pathophysiology underlying type 1 diabetes, there's first a genetic susceptibility and then something that happens, either an autoimmune destruction of beta cells in classic type 1 um, diabetes or some toxin-induced um, destruction of beta cells of the pancreas in things like alcoholic um, diabetes. And these then result in an insulin deficiency where the body doesn't have the insulin it needs to function. Type 2, in contrast, as you see on this slide, is a little bit more complicated. There is both a genetic predisposition um, as well as typically an obese um, phenotype or an obesogenic lifestyle that together comes to produce insulin resistance. Early on, the body may have compensatory beta cell hyperplasia. <coughs> And during that time, the patient will usually be normal glycemic. But with time, as the beta cells um, can't keep up with that increased need for insulin, uh, we'll see people develop what's called impaired glucose tolerance. People who lose a bunch of weight will often be able to get themselves back down to a place where their pancreas is able to keep things in balance. But otherwise, um, if things progress, people will go from impaired glucose tolerance to uh, full-blown diabetes when their beta cells are really not able to keep up with their body's demands. And then we have gestational diabetes, which we mentioned again is related to pregnancy. Depending on the population studied, effects from 0.2% to up to 20% of pregnancies among women who are um, with risk factors before pregnancy. The risk factors are similar to those for type 2 diabetes and most uh, predominantly include obesity. 
and gestational diabetes carries a number of risks that are really quite similar to those of pre-existing diabetes, though perhaps not as extreme. For mothers, uh, there's risks of hypertension um, that's not necessarily causal, but maybe runs alongside the gestational diabetes as well as risks of preeclampsia and then a need for cesarean section. For uh, babies born of pregnancies uh, affected by gestational diabetes, uh, there's macrosomia or babies that just grow too big because there's sugar um, in more places than usual. And when the baby is too big, that can result in birth trauma. And then there's a risk that after the baby comes out into the world and isn't in the same place that it was previously getting all this extra sugar, um, it can have relative hypoglycemia. So we can see these babies suddenly have a drop in their sugar levels. Women who have had gestational diabetes during pregnancy need to be screened later in life um, on a regular basis to make sure that they don't go on to develop type 2 diabetes. Um, and testing for gestational diabetes is routinely part of prenatal care using either a one or a two-step approach to screening. All of these types of diabetes carry risk of macrovascular complications. I guess gestational diabetes less so unless it's gone on to full-blown type 2 diabetes. Um, that would include heart disease, peripheral artery disease, and stroke as well as microvascular complications such as renal disease, neuropathy, or retinopathy. So kidney disease, nerve disease, and eye disease. And um, what we see is that people who keep their sugars well controlled are able to delay the time that they have from uh, first noticing that their kidneys are weakening to actually fully having renal failure, similarly with their nerves from having difficulties with sensation to being uh, with so many injuries to that foot that they develop ulcers and non-healing wounds that require amputation, uh, with amputation uh, most commonly in this country being due to diabetes, and similarly with retinopathy where people can have that treated early on and avoid vision loss, which again is a common late term sequelae of diabetes. The metabolic syndrome is in many ways a precursor to type 2 diabetes. Um, it is a syndrome that has a number of different factors that come together to get that name. So those include abdominal obesity, elevated triglycerides, low HDL, elevated blood pressure, and an elevated fasting glucose. Um, a large waist circumference, that abdominal obesity is really in some ways the driver of all of this, and patients who are able to reduce their abdominal obesity will see a reduction in the risk of all of these different factors. All of these come together to increase risk of cardiovascular disease. And so um, taking this seriously and trying to reverse the course early on is definitely something that would be useful to patients. So we have another question, how can diabetes affect fertility? And there are a number of ways in which diabetes can affect fertility. Um, early on in life, young women who have type 1 diabetes may see that um, their menarche is actually delayed. Later in life, women with diabetes may have earlier menopause, and they may more frequently have irregular periods, oligomenorrhea, or actual amenorrhea. The other issues that we see for women with diabetes more frequently are infections. Those sugars that run high are good sources of nutrition for bacteria and yeast. So women will often have vaginitis, yeast infections, and urinary tract infections. So one of the big take-home points for people working in reproductive health settings is that if you see a woman with recurrent yeast infections or recurrent urinary tract infections, rather than just treating that with an antimicrobial agent, we need to step back and think, is there something else going on? Does this woman have underlying diabetes that we should be screening for? And would she really be best treated by getting her sugars controlled in addition to trying to use an antimicrobial? microbial treatment. We mentioned before that diabetes can complicate pregnancy, but just to review that again, diabetes increases risks of preeclampsia and of cesarean section, and so uh, lots of reasons to try to help women make sure their sugars are well controlled before they pursue pregnancy if that's what they're interested in. Again, there's neonatal risks as well. This is not just a maternal health issue, 
but um, for infants who are large for gestational age or what we call macrosomic, labor can be prolonged. It's more common for birth trauma to occur, such as shoulder dystocia, and for um, there to be a need for a cesarean delivery because the baby just doesn't fit all the way out. All of these increased risk of fetal hypoxia and intrauterine death, um, as well as these babies who are born large for gestational age are more likely to go on and in later life develop diabetes and obesity and metabolic syndrome themselves, whether that's genetic or whether that's due to the dietary environment they grow into, um, has to still be a little bit sorted out. But the other big issue is birth defects. And women with poorly controlled diabetes have approximately a threefold increase in risk of birth defects compared to women who either don't have diabetes or who conceive when their sugars are well controlled. Those birth defects can include anencephaly, a fetus that develops without a brain, microcephaly, a very small brain, and congenital heart disease. And these risks are directly related to how high their sugars are. So we really, if a diabetic woman is interested in pregnancy, want to help her to get her hemoglobin A1c down below 7 before she um, pursues pregnancy. Um, the other thing that we worry about is just increased risk of fetal demise or spontaneous abortion. But all of these risks can really be uh, minimized with proper management of diabetes. So one of the key messages for clinicians working with women with diabetes is that if you want to get pregnant, I'm happy to help you control your sugars so we can make sure your pregnancy is healthy as possible. We don't want to be saying, oh, you have diabetes, you shouldn't get pregnant. That's not the message because then women think that if they want to get pregnant, it has to happen by accident. And accidental pregnancies with diabetes can be very challenging. It's much easier if we've gotten all of our um, all of our issues tidied up before we start a pregnancy. So let's look at this case study. This is a 29-year-old woman. She's clinically obese. Her body mass index is 38. And she's here just for an annual visit. She's sexually active with a male partner and uh, wouldn't mind becoming pregnant. And so the question is, what issues should you be talking about with her today? Um, and so one of the big ones is to make sure that she knows that because of her obesity, she's going to have increased risks of adverse pregnancy outcomes. And it might be better if she wants to be pregnant to work on bringing her weight down before she um, becomes pregnant. And that it might be good to use contraception until she gets her weight down to a healthier range. And that we have a number of contraceptive options that would be safe for her. And really, with this profile, any contraceptive she might want would be fine. The only caveat perhaps being that there's some evidence that Depo-Provera can cause some women to gain weight, and that might not be something she would be looking for. So should you screen Janice for diabetes and or hypothyroidism? And I would argue you probably should. She's clinically obese, and we know that both a diagnosis of diabetes and of hypothyroidism would be something that we would want to manage differently during pregnancy. Both um, diabetes and hypothyroidism can affect fetal brain development. If she had diabetes, we would want to help her use medications to keep her sugars low enough that her hemoglobin A1c, that three-month average of her sugar control, was below 7. And if she had hypothyroidism, we would want to get her started on um, supplemental thyroid hormone or levothyroxine to try to make sure that her body has enough of that hormone to allow proper fetal brain development. Again, we would want to encourage weight loss because weight loss and getting to a healthy weight before pregnancy is a uh, good way to try to improve um, improve pregnancy outcomes, avoid preeclampsia, avoid cesarean sections. And advising her to avoid pregnancy until her own health is optimized and providing her with good contraception to make sure that happens is all going to be an important part of helping her have a healthy pregnancy when she wants to 
Encouraging folic acid supplementation is also going to be important. And there's some data that would suggest that women with diabetes who are at increased risk of neural tube defects during pregnancy may benefit from taking higher doses than the simple over-the-counter 400 micrograms of folic acid. So uh, different clinicians have different practices. Some say 800 micrograms. Some just go with a milligram of folic acid. Uh, it's water soluble. You can't overdose on folic acid. So the idea that the more the better um, is often something that uh, clinicians will move forward with in terms of folic acid supplementation for diabetic patients. And then the last thing is to try to make sure that as she's thinking about pregnancy, that she thinks about lactation following pregnancy and making sure that she's got the support she will need after pregnancy to ensure that she's able to breastfeed as she would like to because women who are obese and women with diabetes tend to have more difficulties with lactation than women who are normal weight or women who don't have diabetes. And we also know that women who don't breastfeed are more likely to go on to develop diabetes in the future. In fact, as little as one month of breastfeeding after delivering a baby significantly reduces a woman's risk of developing diabetes in later life. So while breastfeeding can be challenging for many women, really important for uh, the maternal health to try to make sure we get women the support they need to succeed in breastfeeding their babies if that's something they're interested in and able to do. So with that, we'll open it up for questions. And just before we get there, take a quick minute to just summarize. We've mentioned that there's a number of different types of diabetes. Type 1, which is insulin dependent because the pancreas is not functioning. And type 2, where there's insulin resistance in the body's tissues. And we can use either oral medications or injectable medications. And then there's gestational diabetes during pregnancy, which often resolves when the pregnancy resolves, but can be a heads up that that woman may be at risk of type 2 diabetes in the future, and then late onset um, of type 1 diabetes. So recognize that, that it's not purely a, uh, a condition that only affects children. So some people think of type 1 as childhood onset. We also wanted to make sure that you were familiar with the risk that diabetic patients face of both macrovascular complications and microvascular complications, that these often grow out of the metabolic syndrome. And if we put ourselves on watch in clinic to try to recognize our patients who have early signs of the metabolic syndrome and screen them for diabetes and get them treated, we may be able to help them avoid these complications in later life. And then finally, there are a number of different reproductive health implications of diabetes, including changes in fertility, um, increased risk of both catadal vaginitis, as well as urinary tract infections, and then a number of maternal and neonatal risks of adverse pregnancy outcomes.